So uh, I'm going to try to take a practitioner's uh, view and uh, try not to side on either you know, Piero's uh, perspective or John's perspective on, uh, on the Eurozone and, and spend a little bit of time thinking about, uh, from a practitioner's perspective, how do we deal with the mess? Um, or, you know, how do we deal with, um, you know, all the goodness that comes when, uh, when the Eurozone problems are, um, are eventually sorted out? So um, maybe I'll, I'll just make some observations um, <clears throat> rather than trying to make first, um, you know, some, some prognostications. Uh, but um, b before I go into too much detail, I guess um, I, sh I should start with a joke too because <clears throat> I know that whatever I say is, is you know, 49 to maybe 50 percent wrong, um, and that's fine. So, so we get that, right? So we're going to do our best to deal with um, a whole measure of uncertainty. Um, but that, that message really hit home recently um, when my son uh, came to me with a joke, and, and my wife's from Panama, so a Latin American connection, and, and in, in Panama they love telling jokes, and so my wife was telling jokes, my son was telling jokes, and my son said, well, Daddy, um, he's only 12, he said, um, so how many bankers does it take to screw in a light bulb? Okay, where'd you got me? So, um, so he said two, he said uh, one to stand on the chair and the other to twist. <laughs> 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 and I thought, oh goodness, you know, the bankers have really, really fallen out of, uh, out of favor here. Um, so, um, so uh, uh, and that's, um, and I say that joke because I really, I really do think that, um, that a lot of what we're talking about here, and particularly in the Eurozone, is incredibly difficult to, um, to, to foretell, and, and Pierre mentioned that, and, and John talked about um, so many of the issues uh, that we face in the Eurozone, and, and I think um, it really, the, the world's focus right now, um, and, and potentially for, for, for all of next year, will be very much focused on the Eurozone. Um, so, so what are my observations? The first observation is that uh, there actually will be global growth, so that's good. Um, you know, we've seen plenty of times in the world where there has not been growth, so there will be a lot of global growth. It's just not coming out of those countries where it traditionally has come from, right? That's great, as far as I'm concerned. Um, it's still growth. <clears throat> the second thing that I would um, observe is that the volatility of, of, of growth um, is very significant, particularly in the past several years. And this is a theme which will fit into other observations I make. And that is that, that we're going through periods where there's very fast growth and then we slow down again, um, and so on and so forth. And, and I think um, we'll see more of that pattern over the next um, uh, several years, if not, if not even longer. Um, so uh, what are the different um, uh, downside risks to uh, to the current environment, and what are the things that, as practitioners, whether you're running a company or you're thinking about strategy or running risk management, um, what are the things that we really need to be cognizant of? So, first, uh, fiscal austerity. Um, uh, that, that's going to have a very, very significant impact, particularly here in the eurozone. Um, secondly, uh, credit tightening. John's talked about that. Um, a, a real significant um, decline in, in business and consumer confidence. Uh, and, and I think it comes down to um, a pretty simple reason, and, and that is that nobody's confident in what a risk-free rate is, right? Um, and if you don't have a confident you know, view of what a risk-free rate is, uh, it's really hard to have the confidence um, to make decisions about the future. Right? Uh, and I would, even, I would even submit that um, uh, I at least have very little confidence in the U.S. Uh, Treasury 10-year uh, yield um, as being any kind of indicator of what a risk-free rate is. I think there's so much noise in that um, a bond price right now um, that I don't, ref I don't think it really, I, I think it, it's the best the market can come up with, right? Uh, that I'll agree with. But, um, but I don't think anybody believes that a real, true representation of the credit risk that you take on um, investing in the United States right now has got a 2% handle on it, no way, right? Um, you know, not, not with, um, you know, what is happening on, uh, on, on, uh, in the White House, not with um, the outlook for inflation, um, not with, uh, you know, with, uh, if you're in, in knowledge of the fact that so much of the U.S. debt stock is, is in foreign hands. Um, but um, you know this this uh, concept that there is no risk-free rate um, 
you know, is, is driving some strange behaviors um, and some strange policies. Um, and um, uh, we see that in what the ECB is doing. You can see the different stages of, of uh, purchasing that the ECB has done um, uh, on the lower left-hand side. I mean, that, that's a very significant amount of, of sovereign bond purchases. It's not as much as the UK or the US, but it's starting to get um, pretty big. Uh, and, and I think we'll see a lot more of that. Um, and uh, that introduces a significant amount of, of uh, cross-country credit risk within, um, within the Eurozone. And one of the things that I like to look at, from, again, from a pr practitioner's perspective, is a, a real sort of basic you know, point of view, and that is, you know, you know, goes back to this old saying that, you know, if you owe the bank, you know, a million dollars, it's your problem. If you owe the bank a billion dollars, it's the bank's problem. Um, <laughs> You know, look, look, at, look at how much Germany is owed by the ECB. Germany is owed $465 billion as of sort of the end of October. I'm sure it's a lot more now. That's 18% of GDP. Um, Germany's not leaving the Eurozone anytime soon. <laughs> not, not because of whatever historical reasons, which are very good. Um, not for any sort of practical um, reasons of sort of ongoing, you know, um, trade with the rest of, of the Eurozone, which I think are very good, but just from a very practical perspective, that uh, once you're in this deep, it's, it's really hard to get out. Um, so I, I think, in general, there'll be um, an attempt to try to fix things. So I, I tend, longer term, to be um, more of an optimist uh, than a pessimist about things, but um, you know, the, the, the natural result of um, all this uncertainty um, the natural result of, of a concern about what really is the risk-free rate, um, a natural result of uh, stock market valuations. If you look at the valuations of banks, our shareholders are giving us a very clear message. Um, but you add on top of that the, the regulatory mandate around um, you know, certain core tier one ratios, um, you know, um, all of the, uh, the phased in fossil three um, provisions around uh, leverage and liquidity, you, you can imagine the impact on um, on banks. Um, so, um, if you need to borrow money, you better get in queue now. <laughs> Line up now, because there ain't going to be too much um, in the next couple of years. I think you'll see a huge squeeze on uh, on credit. Um, it'll it'll be unfortunate. It's an unfortunate sort of pro cyclical um, result of, of a whole range of, um, of regulatory changes, which were in place. Frankly, even before um, you know, Bear Stearns, Lehman Brothers, the sovereign uh, debt crisis in Europe, and so on and so forth. Um, but, um, but I think sometimes people forget uh, what the essential role of a bank is. A bank is, is supposed to you know, take in short-term deposits and you know, lend long-term, right? Um, but the way in which many of the rules of Basel III are written, um, you know, we're going to have to sort of take in 10-year deposits to lend 10-year you know, money. That's a bit unfortunate, I think. Um, you know, we're going to an extreme, and, and regulators in society, I think, are missing, you know, um, and, and you know, really need to rethink what it is that a bank is supposed to do, um, and, and, and certainly um, within certain, certain central banks, I think central banks need to rethink what central banks are meant to do, because um, going, going back and, 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 um, and remembering, you know, the reasons we set up these institutions and, and the fundamental histories that drove them, um, I think, are really important in the current environment. So um, you can you can see that the deleveraging is going to take place. No, nobody wants to buy, um, you know, bank debt. You know, that's that's all going to just have to get uh, absorbed. So um, ten times leverage ratios. You can just imagine the the leveraged impact on the um, on the credit uh, markets of of all these. Um, um, you know, uh, debts that are coming due, which um, at least in the current environment, people are not willing to buy because they don't trust, you know, government bonds. And if you don't trust government bonds, how can you trust the, uh, you know, uh, the banks of those particular governments? Um, I'm, I'm fond of saying that, you know, uh, we got really lucky at Deutsche Bank. Uh, you know, if we had to be a European bank in a sovereign debt crisis, you know, we picked the right uh, home country. Um, <laughs> But you can see why, you know, this concept that, oh, well, don't worry, you know, Italy will find a way to, you know, to bail out all the Italian banks, and all of us are sort of looking around at each other in the room and thinking, yeah, right. I mean, um, so uh, so you, can, you can see the impact on, on, on the announced deleveraging up on the right-hand side, and you can see how, you know, credit is already, um, 
you know, starting to get hit, and it's just going to get uh, worse and worse. Um, but look, that's nothing we can do. I mean, there's nothing we can do about it. There's nothing, you know, these sort of alia jacta est and, and, you know, sort of we're well in train. I mean, we've been on this path now for a couple of years. Um, so I, I think we need to, to just um, try to get politicians, regulators, and, and, um, and society in general back on an even keel. But while we're doing that, we need to, I think, be very cognizant of the fact that in this sort of environment where we'll probably just muddle through, um, you know, that there are extreme outcomes and um, uh, we need to be prepared for them and we need to, to do a lot more work thinking about uh, life in terms of stress scenarios um, and preparing for different types of stress scenarios. And that's <clears throat> certainly what we spend a lot of our time thinking about at Deutsche Bank, not just from the perspective of, of daily risk management, but, but strategically, you know, long term, where do we want to where do we want to put our bets? And, and in this kind of environment, um, where should we be uh, growing our businesses? Where should we be shrinking our businesses? And, and so on and so forth. And you know, the observation I'd make is, um, and this is the data is admittedly a bit forced, but the observation I make is that you know recently we're starting to see uh, returns um, not around the mean, but at extremes. Right. So. Um, I, I borrowed heavily from uh, one of my colleagues, Vinay Pandey, who, who describes this as sort of bimodal returns. Um, and, th and the concept is that, um, you know, when, when somebody comes into your office and says, oh, Jesus, you know, we just had a six standard deviation event, and then, you know, somebody else comes in your office a day later and says, oh, nine standard deviation event, and somebody comes like, right. then I just say, well, you know, I, I don't think we have the right models. <laughs> um, <laughs> Maybe, maybe we're trying to force something into, um, into a theoretical uh, world which doesn't exist, and let's just throw it all out and start all over again. So, so again, you know, let's focus on the, on the stress scenarios, and, and, um, and because we're optimists, we you know, we'll probably think that most states of the world things will, will get a little bit better, so I tend to think um, you know, uh, that things will sort of get better, and, and, and uh, we can you know, create a whole bunch of uh, portfolios where you can um, limit your downside and, and, um, and try to position for upside. Um, and we can talk about those, uh, you know, during the, the question and answer session, I'm happy to. But, but generally speaking, <clears throat> in this sort of bimodal world, um, I think uh, there are assets which are really cheap. Um, Piero said something about, um, you know, people who are happy in this environment to buy assets at, you know, 40 cents on the euro, I would say more. Sort of 10 or 15 cents on the euro, um, and not happy about buying assets which are 80, 90, you know, 100 cents on the euro because you don't know what's going to happen. I, I think he's right, you know, and, and it's because we're in this situation where there's so many digital outcomes or bimodal outcomes, um, and I'd much rather be long something which can only lose me 10 or 15 cents rather than long something that can lose me, you know, 60, 70, 80 cents. But um, you know, what, what does that mean? That means, uh, you know, distressed assets of all kinds, I think, uh, you know, particularly with, with money so cheap, um, are very attractive. Um, particularly high yield um, uh, debt, very high yielding corporate um, equities, I think are very attractive. Um, uh, commodity currencies, commodities, um, real assets in general, I think uh, we've seen for, you know, almost three decades, um, maybe even longer by certain measures, an outperformance of financial assets over, uh, over real assets. Um, I think that's going to turn around pretty dramatically. It has been for some time now. I think that will continue for, for quite a period of time. Um, uh, and, um, you know, in the, in the, in the developing markets, um, I'm not expecting miracles. I'm expecting you know, interest rates to trade at a very tight range, very low. Um, it's the pain trade, so to speak. Uh, you know, as uh, as the developing markets are trying to save for retirement, right, you'll get really low yields, so nobody will be able to save enough money. Everybody's going to have to painfully work harder um, and work longer, uh, put off retirement, and so on and so forth. Um, you know, in essence, I, I think you know we've gone through a big bubble. People are going to have to lose a lot of money, and it's just a question of trying to lose the least, um, which is not a hugely optimistic way of, of describing what's going to happen in the world, but um, you know, in a situation where you know the only outs are painful deflation or equally painful inflation, um, you know, we're not quite sure which way we're going to go. Either way is not great. You know, you're going to lose money in one shape 
perform, it's just a question of how. Um, and then, but, but the things that, that I think from a practitioner's perspective would be interesting for a broader audience are things like how in, in the new world does one position, say a manufacturing company, would you go and, and, and actually build a manufacturing plant in Vietnam right now, for example? Um, I don't want to pick on Vietnam, but any, any developing uh, country. Maybe not. Maybe not in an environment where emerging market FX you know, is going to have to appreciate uh, dramatically um, and where um, real wages in many emerging economies are going to catch up to those of developed market economies. Maybe the right thing to do is, is actually uh, quite different and, and to be building uh, factories and investing in, in Europe and the United States. Um, those are sorts of um, interesting um, uh, I think the thoughts that, that come from this, um, this sort of an approach to thinking about your business as a portfolio. And uh, Bruce is giving me the, uh, the time's up sign, so I, I'm going to stop there and I look forward to, uh, to Q&A. Thank you.